Okay, so remember we have these five elements of structure that we're dealing with in the head and the neck. So last week we had skeletal ex experience with the skull. We listed out the joints. So this week we want to deal with the muscles, the blood vessels, and the nerves. So let's talk about muscles. You have a pink handout that you want to look at as we go along here. If you look closely at it, you can see that there are five groups of muscles on the handout. And let me just take you through the five groups very quickly, and then we'll go back and take them a little more slowly. We'll look at more detail. So here, uh, the first group, muscles that move the head and the neck. Um, and of course, these are muscles in and around the neck area, anterior and posterior. Uh, you're going to see that the trapezius is one of these. Um, and so that's a muscle that we re will revisit. Um, there are facial muscles. This is an interesting group of muscles because although these anchor on the skull, most of their insertions are on the skin. This is where we get facial expression, which is such an important part of us communicating amongst one another. The fourth or the third group are the muscles of mastication. Mastication is the fancy word for chewing, right? And you've got <clears throat> muscles all the way up here on the side of the head, right down into the, the ones on the lateral side of the jaw. You've got some deeper muscles that are involved in here as well. So you've got a group of muscles that are part of chewing. The hyoid muscles... We mentioned the hyoid bone in the lab. You can see it standing out there. Here's the Adam's apple. Here's where the thyroid cartilage is. You can see where the hyoid bone is. And those swallowing activities, vocal activities, um, typically move the larynx around. A few muscles anchor onto the cartilage of the larynx, but most muscles in this area anchor to this bone and control the movement of the larynx through the hyoid. The hyoid has a ligament that anchors it directly to the larynx. So the hyoid muscles, one's above and one's below. You can see there are ones that are superior to the hyoid and ones that are inferior. And then the last group are the muscles that rotate and turn the eye, the eyeball within the socket of the skull. Okay, so five groups of muscles. Let's look at them now in a little more detail. Um, the two big, big muscles that you want to know here in the group that move the head and the neck are the trapezius, and most of us know this by now, that big kite-shaped muscle in the back. Um, you can even see it anteriorly here where it wraps over the shoulder. Remember one of its insertions uh, was the distal clavicle. Now you do, if we were doing origins and insertions, you'd need to reverse some of that. Because remember, we gave it the anchor points or the, insert, or the origins on the skull, the nuchal ligament, and the vertebra. And it was inserting out on the shoulder. Well, that's because we were speaking of the movement of the shoulder. Now that we're speaking of the movement of the head, we would have to give the shoulder as part of the origin and the skull as part of the insertion for this. Its number one partner is sternocleidomastoid, which is the muscle that runs on the side of the neck from the mastoid process, right? And this is one of those names that gives you origin and insertion, originates on the sternum and the clavicle, and it inserts on the mastoid process. So remember mastoid here is that bony lump right behind your ear, okay? This is the one if you kind of contract your neck, pull your head forward, you'll get this, these two V-shaped muscles that run from medial to lateral on the skull. And in concert with the trapezius are part of turning your head and flexing your neck. So those are the superficial, obvious ones. This, it's also going to help if you know these together because when we get to the nerves, one of our 12 cranial nerves... Uh, its whole job is to work these two muscles. So 
When you study these as partners, it'll help you with the nerves. Now, there's also some deeper muscles here. You can see a better view of the trapezius here. <clears throat> but notice the splenius capitis here and the semispinalis capitis, two muscles that are deep to trapezius. They run sort of at different angles up underneath to help, again, move the head. <clears throat> if you've got an older edition of the textbook, um, some of the lines here were not placed properly. So um, you want to make sure that when you see this, this muscle right here is the splenius, right? And the deeper one, the one that runs more vertically, is the semispinalis. So you might want to check whatever textbook you have, whatever picture you have. Make sure all those leader lines, the ones that point to the various muscles, are pointing to the right places. So not a big list, just four muscles here. There are, there are many more that we could put on a list. We could, we could double or triple that list. But these are the four major ones here. And the second group of muscles, the muscles of, oh, sorry, I forgot I had this in there too. This shows you just all those other little muscles. Here's the semispinalis, its vertical appearance. These are all those other little ones I could use if I wanted, but... We're going to go right past those. Let's go to muscles of facial expression. <clears throat> In the muscles of facial expression, um, you've got all these muscles all the way through the, uh, the front of the face. And I guess I've got this here so that you can see from the side view where all these muscles are, right? sternocleidomastoid, you can actually see all four in this picture here. <laughs> One more, okay. Now let's go here. Okay, facial expression. Um, when you look at all these muscles here that, that cause facial expressions, the ones that stand out are probably these circular muscles. You've got a circular muscle around each eye and you've got one around the mouth. Uh, those, those type of muscles in the face are called orbicularis, orbicularis, like an orb is a circular object. And then you simply put another word with it that describes it. If you see orus, you should think like oral, like the mouth, and oculi, like ocular, like having something to do with the eyes. So there's two orbicularis oculi muscles, and one orbicularis oris muscle. Um, if, again, if you do origins and insertions, like on these muscles here, the origin is the insertion. The muscle fibers run all the way around the circle and back. <clears throat> there is some connective tissue out here. When you think of these muscles, when you tighten these muscles, the curved lines get straight and the eyes squint shut. So when you close your eyes very tightly, you're using these orbicularis oculi muscles. The orbicularis oris muscle is thought of as the kissing muscle. Um, not the, uh, the big kisses in the movie, but more the little puckered kiss that your aunt, aunt gives you on the cheek or something. So this muscle draws in the wideness of the mouth into a tight little pucker, like a that kind of a kiss, right? But we think of it as the kissing muscle. <clears throat> orbicularis oris. Now add to that muscles up here in and around the forehead. Um, occipitofrontalis we'll see better from a lateral view in just a moment. Um, one of my favorites, corrugator supercilii. You see it over here above the eyebrow. <clears throat> corrugator supercilii. Do you know what a corrugator is? Do you know what corrugation is? Corrugated cardboard. Huh? Not, not tubular exact. It's, it's got ridges in it. It's kind of like wavy, sort of. Um, corrugated cardboard is so interesting because they make a very tough... This corrugated cardboard is the brown cardboard in shipping boxes. You make a very tough cardboard out of three pieces of paper. 
Has that, does that, do the walls of that box feel like they're made out of three pieces of paper? You know, could I take three pieces of paper and, and put them together and I'd get the strength of a box? You wouldn't think so unless you corrugate the inner layer, right? You've got two layers of paper like this that are brown, and then the third layer does this, right? If you look really closely at it, you see it's just three pieces of paper. But architects and designers know that the arch is one of the strongest objects when you build something, right? And so you create these little small arches, and it makes three pieces of paper very, very strong. So corrugation is ridges. Do you ever see ridges across your forehead? Right? Super silly just means above the brow. I think it's so funny because the word makes it sound like Silly, right? Like, uh, you know, like, eh, right? But in reality, when you use this muscle, you look just the opposite, right? When do you corrugate your brow? Yeah, when you look real serious, right? This does not look super silly, right? And the muscle, basically, the insertion is in the middle. The origin is out to the side, and it's just pushing. It's pulling the skin in toward the middle, and the skin is then going to ripple. It's going to... So, corrugator super silly gives you that stern look across your forehead. <clears throat> you can see occipital frontalis a little bit better here. Occipito is back here, isn't it? Right? Frontalis is up here. Right? And some textbooks list these separately. They give you an occipitalis muscle and a frontalis muscle. But the reality is, is that the origin is here and the insertion is over there. And there's this great big sheet of connective tissue that gives sort of an extra thickness to the skin of the scalp right there because you've got this extra layer of connective tissue from these to connect these two muscles. <coughs> <coughs> it also means, though, that any tension in either one of these muscles can then put tension into the other one. So tension at the back of your head can become tension in the front of your head. You know, headaches and things sometimes migrate in different places because tension can make its way all the way from your neck to your eyebrows. So this would be the one that you'd use for that surprise look. And you raise your eyebrows, right? Or if you tighten things here at the back of your neck, part of that, okay? Yeah, it's the epicranial aponeurosis, or in Latin, it's the gallia aponeurotica. Um, you know, an aponeurosis, remember that, is, is like a tendon, except it's sheet-like, so... Epicranial is the English term that they're using now on top of the cranium. Makes sense. <clears throat> now, some of the other muscles in and around, when you look at the face, you see most of the little individual muscles here are clustered around the mouth. And, of course, that's to aid your ability to communicate, to be able to use your lips in just precise little ways to make certain sounds come out. The use of your lips is really, really important in your ability to communicate. Um, and, and really, it's sort of like a sunburst, right? You've got muscles going out in all directions all the way around your lips so that you can pull little parts of your lips in many, many different directions. Um, this zygomaticus major muscle is very famous. Um, the zygomaticus major muscle is the muscle we think of as the smiling muscle. Notice it runs from the corner of your mouth up toward your cheek, which is, right, when you really smile, you're pulling the corners up toward your cheeks. Um, they say it takes less muscles to frown or smile than to frown, right? That's because it's just basically that one muscle gives you that smiling appearance, that with a little, a little squinting of your eyes. And it takes a whole group of muscles to really get the lips coming down in a pouting or a frowning kind of action. Um, the muscle that's over there sort of near it is rhizorius, 
which comes straight back. So it's really one that isn't so much, quite so much a smiling muscle, although the word does have roots that mean smiling back into Latin. Um, underneath this rhizorius, if you took this rhizorius off and some of that fat tissue, you'd see there's a broad muscle here called the bucinator, and that muscle is the inside wall of your cheek, right? Ever, ever bite the inside of your cheek when you were chewing by accident, right? Ouch, right? That, this bucinator muscle works with the tongue to try and keep the food between your teeth as you're chewing, wouldn't be good for all the food to be out to the side or in near the tongue if you want to grind it up. And so the, the tongue and the bucinator kind of play a little dance back and forth, in and out. They dart in and out of the teeth trying to keep the food there. But you try and coordinate that in such a way that they're never in between the teeth when the teeth chomp down. But it does happen. Um... Muscles like levator labii superioris tell you where they are and what they do, right? What's a labii superioris? Upper lip. Upper lip. Labii is lip, superior, upper, upper lip. Levator raises the upper lip, right? This is the hee-haw laugh. <laughs> right? Raise that, just pull that upper lip up. Right? And likewise, there is its antagonist over here, depressor labii inferioris. Pulls down the lower lip. This is sort of the pouting. You know, if you get that lip going down, uh, that pouting sort of thing with the lower lip. Depressor labii inferioris. So those are, those are the major muscles of facial expression. Never, you know think that your facial expression is not important. Uh, most of you have probably taken a speech class, communication class, right? When they talk about communication, how much of your communication is body language? Over half, right? It's like they estimate the, the you know, people that are supposedly in the know estimate that like 55% of everything you communicate to people is in body language. Something like 35% is in the tone of your voice, and only about 10%, and this is just, this isn't like a lecture, because lectures have lots of information in them, but just your everyday commuting, communicating to your family and friends, only about 10% of what you say is meaningful in the words that you say. Right, And so your ability to gesture, to use facial expression, all of that is very critical to your ability to communicate. You can use the same couple of words and mean dozens of different things. Right? My favorite is, don't do that. Right? Parents tend to know these words pretty well. Don't do that. Okay? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, same words, many different meanings, right? Tone of my voice and my body language, right? All of that in these muscles clustered in and around the face here, okay? Okay, many of those muscles from the side view. You want to kind of go back and forth between the side view and that anterior view to make sure that you can see position. Like here you see the rhizorius and the bucinator below it a little bit better. <clears throat> okay, um, muscles of mastication, chewing muscles. These pictures that you have in your textbook are sort of the cutaways let me go back just a second here. There are four muscles in the mastication list. Two of them are the power muscles. Two of them are the muscles that provide the strength to grind tough food. And the two are here, masseter 
This is one right here. If you chomp down with your teeth, you can feel a really hard muscle right here at the side, this masseter. And if you remember the zygomatic, do you remember the zygomatic arch in the skull? Right? The masseter comes right off of that. But by coming off of that, what it leaves is a pocket or a space underneath, and this big temporalis muscle then dives under that zygomatic arch and grabs the jaw as well. And the two muscles then pull the jaw up, right? All the power in chewing is closing your teeth, not opening. Opening, is, opening your mouth is no big deal at all. But it's that grinding action, and these are the two power muscles for that. Now, when you look at these, you can see a little bit better here. They've cut the zygomatic arch, so you can see the temporalis here, right? When somebody is really chewing on something, like, like give somebody a good stiff piece of gum, especially, you know, guys, if, if, they've, you know, if they're bald, right? Give them a piece of gum and watch them chew, and you'll just see the sides of their head going boing, boing, you know. You can just see these muscles really working here, major chewing muscles, Oh, now, now deep down under the mandible here, there are two little muscles. They've cut the mandible away here partly, so you can see these two right here. One runs straight back toward the joint. One runs down to what we call the angle of the mandible here. These are the pterygoid muscles. Why? Because they anchor on the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. Do you remember that? I went through that in the lecture, right? Here's the posterior nasal apertures. On either side, there are pterygoid plates and pterygoid hamuli. We, we're going to call them just simply the pterygoid processes. They originate there and then run either laterally or down more at an angle toward the mandible. And <clears throat> it might be challenging to remember one's medial, one's lateral. I just always remember this one runs more sideways, more lateral. And so that's the lateral one right there. The medial one runs down to the angle here. These muscles, because they run side to side, they're what give you this, right? They're doing the adjusting, the little lateral adjustment that you need to get your teeth together or to, you know, the, the cow chew. You know, if you were doing that. But mostly just those subtle little adjustments, getting the teeth back and forth as they're grinding. These are the power ones. These are the adjusting ones. Okay? Four muscles that you chew with. Hyoid muscles, fourth group. Hyoid muscles almost all insert on the hyoid. In fact, if we were doing origins and insertions, you'd love this group. Eight out of the, or I'm sorry, six out of the eight muscles tell you origin and insertion in their name. Especially these ones down here, right? Um, <clears throat> the most obvious one, the medial one here below, is sternohyoid. So what's its origin? Sternohyoid. Sternum, right? The manubrium down here runs up and anchors on the hyoid, right? There's a sternothyroid, sternum to the thyroid cartilage of the larynx. Then there's a little thyrohyoid, thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone. And then the fourth one here, and you'll see it in another picture, omohyoid. The omo refers to the scapula. And I'm not quite sure why that is. But omo is, is a term that relates to the scapula. So it runs from here, from back of the scapula, up to the hyoid. If you look at your list, it's, there's a line drawn there, right? There's a group of four and a group of four. <clears throat> I just went through the lower group. Those are the four below the line or the four below the hyoid. Above the line are the four above the hyoid. So the ones that you see above the hyoid, mylohyoid, stylohyoid, the digastric is up there and geniohyoid, which you don't see in the picture. Um, think of the mylohyoid like the floor of the mouth. It's like a trampoline. It runs from side to side. One of the physical structures on the mandible you need to know is the mylohyoid line. 
And those are the two bony lines from side to side that the mylohyoid, you can see the fibers run side to side there. Stylohyoid runs from the styloid process, that little spike-like object in front of the mastoid out here to the hyoid. Um, in this picture here, you can see a little bit better. Here's the omohyoid coming from behind, coming up. Um, they've cut away the mylohyoid on this side. See where it's cut and lifted up? And you can see that there's a straight muscle there going from the hyoid to the front of your chin. The front of your chin is the genu of your chin. Guess where that comes from? You know a word that has genu in it? Genu. Genuflect. You know what genuflect is? Many of you wouldn't know that. Right, you kneel, you know, and in, in, in the traditional churches like Catholic churches and others, when you come into a sacred place, you kneel down, you genuflect. Genu, remember, is knee, right? And it really has the concept of bend. And of course, your knee is one of the places where you bend, right? And the point of your chin is where this side of your mandible bends to become the other side of your mandible. So if you look at your at your uh, mandible this way, you've got a great big bend in it here. So this, the point of your chin is your genu, and the muscle that runs from that point to the hyoid is geniohyoid. Okay, reflecting that. <clears throat> and then you can see kind of from this angle the digastric. Notice that the digastric and the omohyoids here, these two both are, they're both digastric muscles. Digastric literally means two bellies. Remember, the belly is the fleshy portion of the muscle. So digastric has its own name. So what I've got is a muscle and then a tendon or a ligament, sort of, not a ligament, a tendon, and then a muscle. Omohyoid here, I have a muscle, a little bit of tendon, and a muscle. And typically this is like, acts like a pulley. So that, because the muscle is angled differently. If you pull this way, you actually pull this way. We're going to run into to three different muscles like that. Two of them are here. You're going to see one in the orbit in just a little bit. <coughs> this lateral view here helps can see the omohyoid running from behind here. They've taken out these other anterior muscles. And here you can kind of see the digastric sweeping through. Comes from the mastoid process up to the point of the chin, but its center anchor is on the hyoid bone. And the, the brain can use both muscles together to raise the hyoid, like when you're swallowing, or it can use the anterior or the posterior muscles separately to pull the hyoid forward or back, part of your speaking apparatus. So eight muscles that are in and around the uh, hyoid bone, four above, four below. Last group of muscles then, last group of the muscles that move the eye. There are six muscles here. They're in two families. There's a newlywed couple Okay, it's a newlywed couple called um, the obliques. And there's a family of four called the rectus. Four rectus are so, so simple. Rectus means straight, and you see the muscles that run straight from the back of the orbit. Uh, where the optic nerve comes in, there's a little tendinous ring right there. And they're kind of like the points of a compass. I almost wish there was a, that picture of the eye from straight in the front. When you see an eyeball right from the front, like this, if you see it with all the other tissue removed, you see a muscle coming across the top, you see a muscle on this side, you see a muscle on this side, and you see a muscle below, just like the points of a compass. And this is superior, this is inferior, this is medial, this is lateral. So there's your four rectus muscles, superior rectus, Inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus. Very simple, very straight, easy to identify. Make sure you know whether you're looking at a superior view. 
So you're looking down on the superior rectus or a lateral view like this where there's the lateral, there's superior, there's inferior rectus. Oh, the obliques are a little more complicated. Um, in this lateral view, you can see the inferior oblique here, which is the easier one. It's very simple. originates from the front corner of your eye, sweeps under the orbit, or uh, down at the bottom of the orbit and around to the posterior side of the eye. Right? And so it can pull, it can pull this outside of the eye sort of down. The odd, odd, odd muscle of all of these is the superior oblique, right? Get the easy ones out of the way and then take some time with superior oblique. It's best seen from the superior view. <coughs> its tendon is right here, but notice that it runs through a little pulley. So whereas the inferior oblique originates in the anterior part of the orbit, Superior oblique comes back from the same anchor point that all the rectus muscles do. It's running up right alongside the medial rectus, a little bit superior to it. But it comes right to this little bit of connective tissue. You remember another trochlea in our study about a month and a half ago, two months ago? Trochlear notch, right? Remember fit onto the trochlea of the humerus? Remember that? There was a capitulum and a trochlea. And we took the name from the word pulley, right? <clears throat> well, this isn't a bone, but it is a little bit of connective tissue that functions as a pulley. The muscle comes through here and then runs in the same diagonal direction that the inferior oblique does from the front corner of the orbit to the back of the eyeball like this. So the muscle pulls that way, but the angle of pull on the eyeball is this way in an oblique action. You want to remember this trochlea, this little pulley, because the nerve that makes this work, the cranial nerve, will be called the trochlear nerve. And trochlear doesn't make any sense for anything in the skull except this one muscle. And kind of shows you how important the muscles in and around your eye are. One quarter of all your nerves in your head work to move these muscles. And this one nerve, cranial nerve four, is called the trochlear nerve. This is the only muscle it works. I've got one entire nerve to just work one little muscle in my eye. But it's a critical thing. The ability to move your eyes is so important to your ability to function in the world. And so these six muscles are just very, very important. Okay? Any questions there? Okay, five groups of muscles, right? And again, you don't, um, you don't need to do origins or insertions. You should know basic functions, and you should be able to locate them in any diagram and label them. You know you'll see some pictures on the test related to muscles. Say that again? No, there's not a muscle quiz. Yeah. The only there's a skull quiz Thursday.